Church family and those who have joined with us for our online service. Welcome and thank you for being with us again this weekend. You know, we're happy to be starting a new sermon series. Pastor Llewellyn will be kicking us off talking about parables of the kingdom. And you know, as we think about being able to come together in this way, where we know we have this opportunity to join our hearts together and our faith together, we have this unique, again, opportunity today to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, to bring a sacrifice of praise, and to just know that God has so much for us, so much for us as we are ones who are in his kingdom, sons and daughters. Once we invite Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior, it is just such a rich opportunity again to come together. You know, before I pray, I just have one verse that I want to share with you here today. It's found in Colossians 3 and 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let's have a thankful heart. We can have so many things that we can look to to say, thank you, Jesus, for the rich blessings that we have. And so as we are thinking in that direction, we're thinking as well of Jordan and Chantel Gadsby, who have uh, recently become the new regional directors for the Apostolic Church of Pentecost and who will be responsible for this region of Saskatchewan, including the Regina Apostolic Church. And I will tell you, we are so thankful to have them as a part of our broader family and our broad, broader brothers and sisters in Christ that we can walk together. And they're going to give such great leadership to this part of the ACOP. So let's just pray for them and then just for our service as we kick it off. Lord, we're thankful for Jordan and Chantel. 
We're thankful that they have been called into this role as regional directors for the ACOP. And God, I just pray that they would just be filled with your wisdom. They would be filled with your insight and your understanding. That God, even as they've come from Nipawin and they've got, God, just such a beautiful church uh, in Nipawin. God, I just pray that all of the breakthroughs that they've seen happen there. God, that there'll be just many insights that they can share with our church and just with the churches in our region. God, we're, we're open-handed and open-hearted to receive, Lord God, as we minister together. And God, we're thankful that we get to sing together now songs and spiritual songs unto you that you're just so worthy of our praise. We love you, Jesus. And I just pray that for each one who would just engage in their hearts, just step into worship right now. Lord, I'm thankful that your spirit is just going to speak into the deep places of all of our hearts, that we can worship you together in spirit and in truth. God, just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be able to worship alongside you this morning. So, and we love that you are participating and watching online. But we would also like to tell you there are three in-person live stream services that you can be a part of. The times are 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. every Sunday. So if you would like to be part of that, just register at Church Center online or call the church and we can help you with that. Um, we wanted to let you know that prayer goes on during the church at, um, during the week and you can be part of that. Prayer is a very important part of our lives as believers and it's really communication and conversation with God. So you can come out and join us in person Tuesdays, 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m or Sundays in person or Zoom, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, you can see our website for details on the Zoom call. Well, beginning Sunday, April 11th at 2 p.m., Pastor Llewellyn is offering a new four-week study called Understanding Your Life in Christ. And which of us doesn't need that? <laughs> All of us. So it's open to new believers or anyone who would like to deepen their understandings of the fundamentals of our faith. So you can register online or on the church app. Um, there are 30 seats available. So keep that in mind when you are thinking about registering. Well, we just want to bless you today. And um, as Ephesians says, we want you to know the width, height, depth, and length of God's love. And you know, that's really immeasurable. So um, as we move into the teaching today, let the word fill your hearts. And we just pray that you would enjoy the presence of the Lord. I want to start my message today by asking you a question. And I want you to think about it. Have you ever been around someone or worked with someone or observed someone who has mastered the art of complaint or has taken it up a level and has somehow earned their degree in whining? Compare that person with someone who displays a gracious, humble, welcoming spirit. You know, there's a stark difference between these two distinct personality types. One is difficult to approach, whereas the other is respectful and receptive. One doesn't do well with acceptance, but the other is welcoming and kind. One isn't all that aware of the complaining and whining they're doing, while the other is fully aware of his or her presence in the company of others. You know, as far as I'm concerned, few things grate on me more than being within listening distance of a whiner. Now, you may agree with me or not, but that's how I feel. I've heard too many people grumble when there's every reason in their life to be grateful, whether it's up close and personal or whether it's somewhere within earshot. Whining is piercing. It's piercing to the ears, but even more so, it's piercing to the heart. Now, are you with me? I think you know exactly what, or better yet, who I'm talking about. You know that person. Yes, that person who constantly whines and complains about how unfair things are or how unfair someone is being, and they're not afraid to let everyone know. I'm sure you've heard the complaints just like I have. It's either too hot or it's too cold. It's too light or it's too dark. It's too expensive. And if not that, then it's too cheap. The line is too long. The teller is too slow. The work is too hard. You know, whiners always seem to deserve better, at least for them. Whiners always want more. Whiners always warrant for themselves different treatment than what they're getting at that moment. But here's the problem with this kind of thinking, when with this kind of logic. See, for whiners, every moment is that moment. Every moment should somehow be different than what it is. Whining makes its roots in dissatisfaction and discontentment. For a whiner, nothing seems fair. Something seems wrong or at its best is out of place. Everything is flawed. And for a whiner, anything is better than what the whiner has. Not much satisfies. Even opportunities are rare, and even they don't seem to gratify. 
You know, there's something else that might more easily satisfy the everything else that doesn't quite seem to fulfill enough for long enough. You put a whiner to work and there's always something in the work or someone at work that's worth whining over. Even the boss receives his or her share of the brunt end. So I'm going to just go out and say it. Whiners don't make great workers. If you've worked with one, you know, and you also know I'm right. And right about now, you might also be wondering where I'm going with all this wine talk. It's possible that you're even whining about it to the person you're sitting next to as you're watching online. You might even be whining about having to watch the message online. Believe me, I'm not whining. What I am doing is making a point. Ironically, that's exactly what a whiner might say. You know, as Christians, we're invited to become followers of Christ, which means that we not only believe in and trust Christ as our Savior, we are to model our lives after our Savior, after Jesus Christ, who was fully approachable and accepting and aware of his presence on earth and the impact he had on those around him. His life radiated with daily grace and generosity, as should ours. His life was one of serving, not one of needing to be served. His life was one of care and compassion, not one of seeking or needing attention. You know, as Christians, we're called to live as ambassadors of Christ, representatives all that the kingdom of God looks like and sounds like and should feel like, as though God were making his appeal through us. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, I'd encourage you to read that passage. It's a beautiful passage. We're also called to be imitators of God as dearly loved children and to live a life of love that reflects to others the fullness of Christ's love and sacrifice for us. You can find that reference in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And like a lamp that fills a room with light as it shines, or as a letter that can easily be read by all, our lives are to be on display for all to see the good work of God that's at work in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew 5, 14 to 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3 are those references. Now understand, we are not saved by good works. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says that, uh, that grace is a gift and it's by grace through faith that we are saved, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And can I just throw in that boasting comes right alongside with whining. But as one saved by Christ, through Christ, we are called to good work. It's a kingdom work, a cause beyond what suits ourselves and meets our own needs. Now, each of the four first, or the, sorry, the first four books of the New Testament, the gospel books as we know them, they're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They portray and highlight the life of Jesus slightly differently. Each one gives us a unique perspective of Jesus' life and his character and even his purpose. You know, the Gospel of Matthew portrays Jesus as a king. The Gospel of Mark portrays Jesus as a servant. The Gospel of Luke portrays Jesus as the Son of Man. And the Gospel of John portrays Jesus as the Son of God. And just as Matthew portrays Jesus as king, the main message, as well as many of the parables of Jesus that are recorded in the book of Matthew, focus on the kingdom of heaven and what it's like. Now, over the next four weeks, we'll be looking at four of these kingdom parables. And our goal in doing so is to not only observe how Jesus described what the kingdom of heaven is like using the parable, but to identify where we can obediently apply Jesus' instruction to our daily Christian life. You know, one of those parables, it's the first one we'll look at together, 
is found in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 1 to 16. It's the parable of the vineyard workers. And since this is a parable about what the kingdom of heaven is like, even before we read it together, it's worth clarifying exactly what a parable is and how the Bible defines the term kingdom of heaven. See, a parable is simply a story used to make a comparison, to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. Jesus often used parables to instruct and help people better picture and understand the lessons that he was teaching. The first words, in fact, that Matthew records as Jesus began his earthly ministry were these. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's Matthew 4 and verse 17. So what exactly did Jesus mean when he used the term kingdom of heaven? Well, the Greek word kingdom used here in this scripture and in other references within the parables uh, towards the kingdom of heaven is a word phrase that contains five key descriptors that imply a collective rule which speaks of God's sovereignty. There's reign which speaks of God's Uh, Sorry, first of all, rule speaks of God's supremacy. Reign speaks of God's sovereignty. The realm which speaks of God's monarchy, his kingship. It's the territory over which he rules and reigns. Then there's the right, which speaks of his authority. And then uh, the reasoning behind it all, behind the kingdom of heaven, it speaks toward an all-sufficiency of God, of the kingdom of heaven. It's not an either or usage of each description, uh, description word, but an and all definition of the main word kingdom. Really, it's an equal reference to both the charge, which is an entrusted responsibility that's associated with God's work and who is ultimately in charge, you know, with a trusted, watchful custody, so to speak, of God's work and what God's work is meant to be like. So as we work our way through each of the four parables in our Parables of the Kingdom series, I want to encourage you to be thinking of and considering these five descriptors. Remember, it's the rule, reign, realm, right, and reasoning behind the kingdom of God as a collective definition to formulate your own personal application for God's kingdom work, both in and through your life. You know, and doing so will help you gain the perspective you need to make sense of what Jesus was saying then and what Jesus continues to say to us now. So we're going to read the parable of the vineyard workers from Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1 to 16. I'm going to read it all the way through from the New Living Translation today. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to follow along with me. Or if you have an electronic device that you would find your app, just go to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to start at verse 1. Here it reads and says, For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal wage, the daily wage, and sent them out to work. And at nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and he saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard, and at noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again, and he saw some more people standing around. And he asked them, why haven't you been working today? And they replied, because no one hired us. And the landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. And that evening he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. And when those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. And when those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. 
I think that's interesting. Note that they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. And when they received their pay, they protested to the owner. You know what they started to do? They started to complain and they started to whine about what they just received. So in their protest to the owner, they said those people worked only one hour And yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And he answered one of them. He said, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? So take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? That's one of the keys of this parable. Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Now There are a few important points that we should highlight from this parable. The first point I want you to notice in the parable is the comparison that Jesus draws to the landowner. It's the landowner's vineyard. He's the one hiring the workers and sending them out to work in his fields. There's also two questions that arise out of this parable. It's a question of ownership, and it's a question of stewardship. Both are also worth noting. So who owns and who stewards? And for what purpose, and for what price, and for what pay? In other words, the reward at the end of the day. And each of these is up to the landowner to determine. It's not for the workers to negotiate or to decide. The landowner would give each of them what he deemed fair at the end of the day. He hired workers at 9 o'clock in the morning, at noon, and again at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then at 5 o'clock, he came back and saw some people standing around not working. In fact, doing nothing. When he asked why they were just hanging around rather than working, they reasoned that no one had hired them. Essentially, they excused themselves from participating as opposed to willingly joining in to get involved. They were waiting for something, maybe waiting for that invitation to, to come in. So the landowner pointed them in the direction of the vineyard and instructed them to join the others. And when he called them all in later that evening, beginning with the last workers to the first, the landowner rewarded each of them with an equal payment of a full day's wage. He was generous and he was gracious. And of course, that's what outraged the first set of workers. And this is often where much of our whining begins too. When our perspective of fairness begins to rule, maybe even break our hearts because human nature tends to overrule and overexamine and overlook the ways of the kingdom of God. We think so differently than oftentimes how we see scripture. See, the way in which we engage the kingdom of God is proportionately, I believe, proportionately influenced by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's our surrendered response to his authority and his sovereignty and his inclusivity and his generosity and his all-sufficiency. See, anything outside of or less than this kind of humble, surrendered, receptive response, and we will trend toward leaning upon ourselves and reason and our own reasoning as our way through whatever we feel is right and best for us when God invites us to trust our way through, leaning on him with faith and hope. We demand fairness where God demonstrates kindness. We easily gravitate toward judgment where God inclines himself toward merciful justice. We beg for equal rights, yet we don't really do all that well when equal rights are actually given. 
We struggle with indifference when God's promises are extended without preference or display of favoritism. Grace is offered to all, period. And that's this parable. It's what it's about. It's about God's grace and God's generosity and it's offered to all. But if we were to get brutally honest with ourselves, we'd be more content if grace were less generous and limited to only some. See, the parable of the workers in the vineyard is a picture of immeasurable grace and acceptance and receptivity. It's a portrait of God's rich grace that's extended toward us at any point in our lives, in our day. And in and it's of our exchange of that same kind of grace to others. That's what the parable's talking about. The parable of the workers in the vineyard is a word for us all that there is always room for one more in God's kingdom, in God's family, anyone at any time. And it's this same open, welcoming, receptive spirit that we are privileged to share. It doesn't matter if you call out to God in your home or while you're driving in your car or at a church service in a crisis moment or if you've hit rock bottom or you're at death's door, there is still room and there's a place for you. Jesus will welcome you in. And whether you've been a devoted follower of Christ for years, as I have, or you gave your life to Christ only days ago, the reward of eternity is equal. You see, the Bible tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In fact, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it tells us that we will be saved. See, there is no preferential treatment given to some and not to others. And if you've never made the decision to fully give your life to Christ and receive him as your personal savior and make him Lord of your life, If you were to do that today, your reward is equal as well. Your reward is not based on what you do or how much you do or how good you are. It's based on and it's determined by the landowner, the Lord himself. So what's our job? Our job is to simply be willing, be obedient, be receptive, be ready, and be grateful. Matthew 9 and verse 37 indicates to us that there is a plentiful, abundant harvest available, yet it's one that is still lacking enough workers to bring in the harvest. You and I are called to be those workers. Church, it does us no good to whine about what we think isn't right or fair or just in the world or whine about our opinions and perceptions of how we think the church should or shouldn't be. It's never to our advantage to whine over what we assume we deserve or how we feel uh, we should be treated or what kind of reward we think we should be given for our length of service or our longevity of faith or even our level of commitment. You see, church, souls are at stake Christ gave his life so that all could experience his kindness and come to repentance. You can see that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 and again in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Lives hang in the balance. There are so many more living in our city and in our local communities who need Jesus. Let's not be whiners making senseless noise that distracts people from turning to Christ. I've heard too much of that over the years. It hinders our testimony and it hurts the church and it creates barriers for people who might otherwise be on the edge of believing. But rather, let's be great co-workers in the kingdom of God, striving for one heart while lifting up one voice that will attract people to Christ for the praise and the glory of our Savior. So as I close, I want to ask you five quick questions, and I want you to prayerfully consider your answer. 
How will you respond to each of these questions? Here they are. Am I willing? Will I be obedient? Am I receptive? Will I be ready? Am I truly grateful? For each one of these questions, I want my answer to be yes. And I trust that your answer to these questions will be yes as well. And as a closing prayer, I want to pray this over us. It's just a simple prayer, but it goes like this. Lord, put me in your vineyard. I'm yours to use. Use me where you need me most. Fill me with love and grace for those you set in my path and for those I have the honor to partner with in your kingdom work. Amen. Now, today, as you're listening to this message, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, and I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And it's as simple as just admitting that you need the Lord in your life, that you've been living your life apart from him. Jesus loves you, and he gave his life for you. We just celebrated that through the Easter weekend. And I want to pray a prayer with you to help you begin a journey of faith, to start your life in Christ. When you come to understand that you need Jesus and admit that, and you can believe who he is, that Jesus Christ is Lord, you confess it with your mouth, and you say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. It's that simple. Just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I need you. I recognize that I've been living my life apart from you. I invite you into my life today to be my Lord and my Savior. I trust you today, and I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin, and give me a new life with a new start. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change my life and make me the new person that you promise that I can be. And thank you today for eternal life. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, would you let someone know? Let us know. Let me know if you want. My email will be on the bottom of the screen. Just Pastor Llewellyn at ReginaApp.com. And, um, or you can call into the church here. Uh, it's uh, just a simple number. It's 306-789-1234. But let someone know. We want to walk with you and help you find some of those next steps. They're going to help you in your journey of faith. You know, the Lord bless you today and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless.